As you are here this evening, feel free to turn to Nahum. That is the minor prophet that we are going to deal with as we continue in our study in the Old Testament, as we continue our journey through the minor prophets. And, uh, you know, when we deal with the minor prophets, we come across some interesting names, names that we're not necessarily familiar with or sound different for our tongue. And uh, Nahum is one of them, but he's not unique just in his name. He's also unique in his ministry. As we, as we introduce this minor prophet to you, understand the context here. Over a hundred years after Jonah preached to Nineveh, remember Jonah and his ministry to the Ninevites or his eventual ministry to the Ninevites, right? God sent another prophet after a hundred years, over a hundred years after Jonah, okay? And the prophet's name, Nahum. The difference between Jonah's ministry and Nahum's ministry is quite distinct. For Jonah, he was telling the people of Nineveh to either turn back or turn to God or God will destroy you. What happened? They turned to God. This is not Nahum's ministry now. Nahum goes to Nineveh to pronounce God's judgment and doom upon them. They have gone beyond the point of no return and there's not any, there's no possibility of being rescued this time. God is coming to uh, judge Nineveh uh, rightly for, uh, for all that they've been doing. So the book of Nahum, what it does here is it demonstrates how false is the view that might makes right. You've probably heard that phrase before, right? If I'm powerful enough, then I'm right enough because nobody can defeat me. Obviously, my way and my opinion is the right one. Nahum demonstrates that that view is totally false. We'll see it as we go in. Nineveh, by the time of Nahum's ministry, was a very powerful city, part of a very powerful nation. And they saw themselves as being invincible, okay? So uh, what Nahum does is he shows us that might does not make right, okay? Uh, the great Assyrian Empire, Nineveh, of course, was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. This great empire boasted of its might and its wealth, but the thing that it did not do was acknowledge its sin. It would not listen to God. Now, isn't this interesting? As Jonah came 100 years previous to minister to the Ninevites, they turned to God. Why is it that they became mighty and wealthy? Some people would say this. It was a result of their turning to God. Unfortunately, though, what happened, as with a lot of human nations and empires, is we may start out well, but we don't necessarily finish well. And here's what the Assyrian problem was, or the Ninevites problem was. Even though they were mighty and they were wealthy, they did not acknowledge their sin, they would not, they would not listen to God, and so the fall of such a haughty nation was inevitable. And that's what Nahum's text reveals for us. He helps us to understand God's judgment upon these people, regardless of their position. As powerful as they were, they would not escape God's judgment. So, as we take a look at the book itself, again, a, a short book, just three chapters, okay? And what I've done, basically, is I've put a title with each chapter, so a three-section three outline. First of all, we have in chapter one, where the destruction of Nineveh is decreed. Not only the destruction of Nineveh, so in other words, what Nahum is saying is, Ninevites get ready, God is going to judge you. But he will also, in his message as well, talk about how God will deliver Judah. Okay? Now, let's remember, let's remind ourselves, the ten northern tribes of the divided kingdom, Israel, the two tribes to the south, Judah, right? And the Assyrians were the ones that took the Israelites into captivity, if you remember, okay? Judah did not go with the, with the Assyrians. They were later taken captive by the Babylonians. So as Nahum is talking about Nineveh and the decreed destruction, he talks about the de destruction of the empire, the destruction of the city, and the deliverance of, of Judah. Then in chapter 2, the destruction of Nineveh is then described. Nahum talks about what God will do, and uh, at times does it quite graphically. So that when we get to chapter 3, we understand 
that not only is the destruction decreed and described, but it is also deserved. In other words, God is being fair, even though the Ninevites would say that he wasn't. So three chapters, three different titles that help us with the outline of the book. But before we get into the details of the book itself, what do we know about Nahum himself? The, the, Nahum is not just a fictional character. Nahum is the one who wrote this book. And we need to find out things about him if we can. The only problem is that very little is known of Nahum's personal life. Um, there is no other place in the scriptures that use the term or the word or the name Nahum. Unless you take a look at Nahum in Luke chapter 3, where it gives the genealogy a line of Christ. Nahum was mentioned. We're not certain, though, whether or not this is the same Nahum. It may be another person. We don't know that for sure. If it is another person, then the Nahum of the minor prophets, there is no other appearance of him uh, in the Old Testament uh, scriptures or even in the New Testament scriptures. But we do know this. Nahum was a prophet of Judah. So he ministered to the tribes to the south. Okay? But his ministry also involved Nineveh. That's the Assyrian capital of that great empire. What is interesting about Nahum's name is this. It's the short form of Nehemiah. Okay? So, as you remember Nehemiah in the Old Testament, uh, you could have called Nehemiah the one who brought back the, the exiles to rebuild the Jerusalem wall. His nickname may have been Nahum. <laughs> A shortened form, right? Of, of, of his name. And what Nehemiah means is uh, consolation or comforter. Okay? So Nahum, uh, his name being comforter or consolation seems kind of ironic because his, his message that he's bringing is not one of comfort. <laughs> the message he's bringing is not one of consolation. It's one of destruction and doom. And so it's interesting that Nahum, with his name, is the one that brings that, that message. As far as his home is concerned, where did Nahum live? Well, according to chapter 1 and verse 1, Nahum was from the town of Elkosh. Okay? We find it in verse 1, the burden against Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite. Okay? So he was from Elkosh. And uh, there are four possible locations of Elkosh that have been suggested. Again, when we're getting into locations of Old Testament uh, areas and cities and towns, uh, because of history, it's often difficult to find out where exactly they were. We got four different possibilities for Elkosh. It could be uh, the one that's located in Assyria that's north of Nineveh, okay? It could be uh, the one that's located southwest of Jerusalem. It also could be somewhere in Galilee, so that gives us a broader perspective again. Or uh, some think it is the current site of Capernaum, is the old Elkish. Now, where uh, the Elkish that, that uh, Nahum grew up in, we really do not know. It really doesn't matter, okay? But uh, we do know he was from the town called Elkish, wherever that was uh, located. Uh, but again, as you said, wherever his home was, what we should keep in mind is that when he was born, the Assyrian, the Assyrian armies had invaded Palestine already. In fact, they'd done it twice, okay? So this threat of this mighty empire was always, was always present. Uh, the one invasion we know of, that was back in 722 BC, where the conquest of the Northern Kingdom by Saragon, or Sargon II took place, uh, that's recorded for us in 2 Kings 17. Um, that's the first time that, uh, that the Assyrians come in and deal with the Northern Kingdom. Uh, the second time was just 21 years later, okay? Invasions against Judah by Sennacherib, okay? That's recorded for us in 2 Kings 18, just the next chapter, okay? So, again, we see that the Assyrian armies are, are large, they're threatening, they're wealthy, they're, they're mighty, they've already been dealing with Palestine in, in its threats, not only in the northern kingdom, but also in the southern kingdom as well. 
And uh, the time period in which Nahum is doing his ministry, there were three kings that ruled over, over Judah. The first one was Manasseh, if you remember that name. I don't know if you do, but that was, was a king of Judah during the By the way, an evil king was not a, a good king, but an evil king. Then there was Ammon, King Ammon, and he also was one that was an evil king. It wasn't until the third king of Nahum's ministry that we find that he was a good king, Josiah, okay? And Josiah was one of those kings that for Judah brought about particular spiritual reforms in an attempt to bring the, the people of Judah back to God, back to the proper worship of the temple and, and all the rest of those, those good things. And so the ruling world empire of Nahum's time was indeed the Assyrian Empire. They were the ones that everybody was worried about. They weren't worried about Egypt. They weren't worried about Babylon. They were worried about the Assyrian Empire. And as we go on a little further, we understand why they were indeed worried about the, uh, about the Assyrian Empire. In fact, during Nahum's ministry, there was a king who was, who was uh, raiding the Assyrian Empire that had a really funny name. All right? Asher Ben-Ahal. Asher ben Okay? Asher ben Okay? Is how you pronounce that. He was the Assyrian king, and he reigned during the earliest years of Nahum's ministry. And uh, it would not be until uh, Nineveh fell in 612 that the Assyrian Empire would be defeated and the Neo-Babylonian Empire, Neo -Babylonian Empire would then take over. This was the doom that, that Nahum would be talking about. The Neo-Babylonian Empire coming in, taking over Nineveh, and destroying the Assyrian Empire. And so, the prophets ministering during the time of Nahum were guys like Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Jeremiah, all ministering around the time that Nahum was ministering as well. In other words, God had lots of messengers out there with regard to what he was going to be doing, what he wanted his people to be doing, what was going to be happening to, especially through Nahum, what was going to be happening to the Nevites, and all the rest of that. Now, that gives us the time period, okay, in which Nahum was ministering. Let's take the kings and the cities of those days and give ourselves a little bit of historical context. So let's go back to the king with the funny name, okay? He can remember, he's the king of the Assyrian Empire. While uh, Nahum is beginning his ministry, he is known as the last of the famous kings of Assyria, okay? After he's gone, nobody really knows much more about Assyrian history after this. And it was after his death in 633 that the power of Assyria and its empire indeed did fade away. And what was the reason why this king was the most famous of the Assyrian kings was because of his exceptional cruelty. Okay? This is another thing that, that, that God was, was judging and why Nineveh would fall on the way it would fall. Uh, this, this king was known for skinning captives alive. This was how cruel he was. Uh, uh, it's recorded in history that he forced a prince to wear the bloody head of his king around his neck. Uh, another instance where he was feasting with the head of the Chaldean monarch hanging above him in the, in the banquet hall. Um, these are just examples of some of the gruesome stories that this king was well known for. That's again why we call, call him the last of the famous kings of the Assyrians, because after his power was gone, uh, Assyria basically faded away into the sunset, never to be, uh, never to be heard from again. Nahum is ministering to the Ninevites in this time period, okay, with a king that is as cruel as you can possibly find. But as Nahum is ministering, who is the king of Judah? Well, King Josiah. We remember him. He reigned over Judah in the uh, in the fear of the Lord, and uh, and uh, we're thinking that Nahum may have written his book during Josiah's reign, a time of relative peace a time of, of, of uh, not having to worry about the Assyrians per se, even though they were threatening, because Josiah was following God's way, God was protecting the people of, of Judah. So we're thinking Nahum may have written his book uh, during this time. 
There's a city that uh, you've probably come across the name of before. Are you familiar with the city of Thebes? Okay. Nahum, and during this time uh, of his ministry, the city of Thebes is, is prominent. It's, uh, Thebes is the Greek name for the Egyptian city of No. Okay? And uh, we find that in chapter 3, verse 8 of, uh, of Nahum. Uh, let's just take a look at it here. Yeah. Are you better than Noamon? Okay? Noamon, he's referring to Thebes. Okay? And in that prophecy, he asks, are you better, God asks, are you better than this Egyptian city? Because Noah at that time was the capital of Egypt. And it would be that city that would be conquered by the Assyrians, the Assyrians, in 663, okay, B.C. Um, and so as God is saying, okay, are you greater than this Egyptian capital city? Okay, <laughs> talking, with, talking with Nineveh, of course, again, it was... Uh, Thebes was one that was conquered by the Assyrians uh, in 663. Another city that uh, comes to mind, of course, is the city of Nineveh. Again, this is the same city of Nineveh that Jonah ministered to some 100 plus years previous. The capital of Assyria, uh, it was a city that was founded around uh, 2000 BC. But during Nahum's ministry, this city was at the peak of its wealth, its power, and its fame. If you notice verses 16 and 17 of Nahum chapter 3, he writes, You have multiplied your merchants more than the stars of heaven. The locust plunders and flies away. Your commanders are like swarming locusts, and your generals like great grasshoppers, which camp in the hedges on a cold day. When the sun rises, they flee away, and the place where they are is not known. Talking about the power of, of, this, of, this, uh, of this city. And... Uh, the city walls during Nahum's day were considered to be impregnable, um, yet Nahum, Nahum would prophesy of the fact that those city walls would fall. Uh, verse 5 of chapter 2, he remembers his nobles, they stumble in their walk, and they make haste in her walls, and the defense is prepared, the gates of the rivers are open, and the palace is dissolved. Again, what was thought to be a city that you could not defeat Nahum talks about its certain defeat. So that in 612 BC, Nineveh was conquered, but not only conquered, but it was demolished as well by the Babylonians and the Medes and the Scythians. And to this day, the city has remained just a heap of desolate ruin. Nineveh has never been rebuilt. And uh, that is the uh, surety of Nahum's prophecy that this city that everybody thought would not be defeated indeed was defeated by God. And so uh, Nahum's prophecy comes true and remains true to this day. So that gives us a background into the man Nahum himself and the time in, in, in which he ministered. Any, any, any questions or, or thoughts that you have there? No, but it's really interesting to me because we just have been going through some of this in Grey United Social. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. The city of Thebes and, and, and Nineveh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, maps and the different empires, Babylonian, okay. and Syrian, and um, what did we learn? Persia with the, the Persians as well, yeah. probably part of that. Yeah, we need to go there. Okay. But anyway, we're into that right now. Okay. Great. So now, this is all we know of Nahum. That's about as much as we are gonna, as we're gonna get from, from what we know in here. Okay, let's talk about his book now. Okay, and uh, we'll begin with the date. The date being when, when did Nahum write his book? We can get about this close. Uh, Nahum wrote his book sometime between, sometime after 663. Okay, but he wrote it before. 612. Now, why do we come to that conclusion? Well, we come to it this way. It's based on, first of all, Nahum's reporting of the fall of Thebes in 310, which had already taken place. Well, when was the fall of Thebes? 663. Okay? So Nahum has already talked about this as having already taken place. So we know that he's writing his book sometime after the fall of Thebes. 
and his foretelling of the fall of Nineveh, which is recorded in verses 8 through 10 in chapter 2, this is still yet future. Well, when was Nineveh defeated? 612. Okay? So that's why we've narrowed it down to that. Okay? Sometime between 663 and 612. We're talking about the grand scheme of things, the amount of human history that's gone, you know, gone on now. A few years between 663 and 612 really isn't isn't a lot. Okay? We we do think though, I don't have it on here, but we do think that Nahum's public ministry probably extended from about 650 to 620. So his ministry was about 30 years, okay, in, in all that he did there. The theme and purpose of his book basically can be stated this way. The Lord in his sovereign holiness and goodness will bring judgment upon sinful Nineveh and spare righteous Judah. Okay? That's basically explained for us in the, in the very first chapter of, uh, of the book. Notice, the Lord in his sovereign holiness and goodness. When we're talking about judgment, we don't often think about goodness, do we? Or even holiness. <coughs> But this is God that we're talking about. So his judgment will be encompassed in his holiness and his goodness. Uh, and he will judge Nineveh, but spare Judah. The, the book itself is mostly about Nineveh. Okay? Uh, again, the subject which the opening sentence introduces is if we uh, again go back to, to verse 1. The burden against Nineveh is the very first sentence. Right? The burden against Nineveh. Talking about God's judgment, that would be that would be <coughs> coming. Excuse me. Not only is the book mostly about Nineveh, but it is also addressed mainly to uh, Nineveh as well. That's why we we would be good to call this book the sequel to the book of Jonah. Jonah is our first introduction into the city and what happens and what takes place, and then Nahum is the sequel. So it's almost like book one is Jonah, book two is Nahum. Okay? With a hundred year gap in there. But we know also that Nahum wrote for the benefit of the people of Judah as well. Remember, he ministered to the Ninevites, but his primary prophetic ministry was to the people of, uh, of Judah. And what Nahum does as he writes for the benefit of the people of Judah <coughs> is he <coughs> answers particular questions that the people of Judah had. Uh, questions like this. Why does cruel Nineveh prosper? Why, we've, we've had the same kind of question, right? Why do the wicked prosper? Guess what? That was the question that the people of Judah had. Why does this, this city that does not follow God, why do they prosper and we don't? Okay? And so as Nahum is writing about Nineveh, he's answering the question of the people of Judah. And that there's coming a day that even though it seems that they're prospering, there is coming a day when God will deal with that. Because another question the problem that the people of Judah were asking was, was uh, has, you know, has God abandoned us? Has God abandoned Judah? And as, again, as Nahum writes about Nineveh, he reminds the people in his, in his decrees about Nineveh that, no, no, God hasn't abandoned you. Uh, wait for him. He is going to be, he is going to be doing his thing. Because they're basically asking this question. Where's the justice? Right? We're God's people. How come we're the ones that are suffering? What's the justice in that, right? Again, familiar questions for us because we've often asked the same questions in our Christian walks, right? Well, as Nahum writes about Nineveh and what God is going to do at the same time, he is writing for the benefit of the people of Judah because now those questions, those burning questions that they have are being answered. Do we not find that God does that many times through the scriptures. That even though it's focusing in on a particular people group or a particular time period of history, do we not find that the benefit of what is written also applies to us, right? That's why we always come to this final question, okay, of every book that we work through. Uh, and we started this with Genesis, and we've done it consistently right throughout. And so when we get to uh, when we get to Nabal, 
there are several things that we want to be reminded of. Nahum teaches us, first of all, several things about God that we need to be reminded of. First of all is this. God is all-powerful and all-knowing. Okay? Therefore, that being the case, that he is all-powerful and all-knowing, he has the right to be the sovereign judge. His judgment upon Nineveh is not by accident. His judgment upon Nineveh is simply the result of him being the powerful, all-knowing God that he is. He knows all the details about Nineveh. He knows what they have done, and he knows what they have not done. And he is the one, because of his power and because of his omniscience, has the right. Again, it's not by accident. He has the position. He has the right to be the sovereign judge. Why? Because Nahum reminds us that God is going to keep his word. Just as he did with the people of Nineveh during Jonah's day, where he kept his word and said, All right, since you've turned to me, I will not destroy you. Now that they are not turning to him, but are turning away from him, that because of the atrocities that these, that these people did to other nations around about them, especially the Israelites, okay, there will be judgment. Certain, God is going to keep his word. Because God is one of wrath and fair judgment. Okay? <coughs> we all, excuse me, we often talk about the love of God. But when we talk about the love of God, we also need to talk about His wrath. Because His wrath is caught up in His love. Why is He, why is he wrathful? Because of His love. And so, He is one of wrath. He is one of fair judgment. The people of Nineveh will say that He is not being fair at all. Okay? But again, remember, He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He has the right to be the sovereign judge. That's why he is one with fair judgment. So this is what Nahum reminds us of, about the character and the nature of God. He is these things and continues to be these things. Something else that Nahum teaches us. As Christians, we are to embrace those things that are good and hate that which is evil. We've seen this in the New Testament too. Doesn't Paul talk about this for us? Okay. Now, when we make a statement like this, we're to embrace those things that are good and hate that which is evil. Let's be careful in our distinctions. For example, we are never placed in the position to act in righteous wrath. We are to hate that which is evil, or in other words, we are to refrain from that which is evil. We are to oppose that which is evil. But that does not place us in a position to act in righteous wrath. Why is that? Because we're not God. Remember, we talked about the fact that Nahum reveals for us the fact that God is one of wrath and fair judgment. We, and that wrath is, is, is in connection with the fair judgment. We can be wrathful, but that doesn't guarantee that our judgment will be fair. Why? Because we're not all powerful. Yeah, we're not all white. Only God is. So, as much as we are to embrace those things that are good and hate that which is evil, we do not have a license for righteous wrath. In fact, it is God's place to avenge because He is the only true righteous judge. Again, do we not see that in Romans? Right? where we are reminded by Paul, it is not ours to take vengeance, it is God's position, right, to take that place. Why? Again, because he is the only true righteous judge. So when we say, yeah, we're to embrace those things that are good and hate that which is evil, let's be careful in our exercise of that. Because remember, we are not God. We know what is in congruence with his nature and his character. We also know that which is not in congruence with his nature and his character. Our responsibility then is to embrace that which is good, refrain or hate that which is evil, and allow God to be the one who is the judge of it all. You understand the distinction we're, we're making there? So give an example of in righteous wrath. 
where we uh, where we will be, as we would say in our vernacular, the uh, the judge, jury, and executioner of a particular person in the actions that they have taken, right? Where we not only uh, help them to understand what was wrong, but we also are the arbiter of the judgment. We are the ones that say yes, and this will be how you will repay with regard to that. Okay? Um, God's place is the place of judgment. Or a particular segment of society that maybe we do not agree with, right? We don't understand the way they think, we don't understand the way they, they, they practice their life, right? And so we then become the ones that not only hate that which is evil, we've already determined that that what they're doing is evil, but we also determine that we are the ones that, that, that have the right to place judgment upon them. No, in actual fact, we don't. It is God who judges them again, not us. Does that, does that help you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, that's an example of, of how, we need to be, how we need to be careful. Now, at the same time, doesn't mean that we accept, accept everything that comes our way. No, we embrace the things that are good. We hate those things which are evil. Recognizing that God is the final judge in all of it. Okay? I want you to notice something else as well. Notice the comparison of, 15, of, of verse 15 in chapter 1 of Nahum. And let's take that and compare it with chapter 10 of Romans. In Nahum chapter 1 and verse 15, we find this. Behold on the mountains the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace. O Judah, keep your appointed feasts, perform your vows. For the wicked one shall no more pass through you. He is utterly cut off. That's Nahum 1, 15. Notice as we go to Romans chapter 10, we find this in uh, verse 15 of chapter 10. Actually, what we're going to do is we're going to pick it up in verse 14 of chapter 10. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, Paul writes, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Notice the phrase, as it is written. Paul is quoting from the Old Testament. Where is he quoting from? Nahum chapter 1, verse 15. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. That's what Nahum had in chapter 1. Isn't it interesting how Paul, and he often does this, especially in his letters to the Romans, where what he will do is he will take what the minor prophets have written and bring them now into the context of where he is ministering to the people of Rome and to the church of Rome. And they begin to see some things that they hadn't seen before that the minor prophets had talked about centuries earlier. But now what Paul was doing is helping to open up their eyes even a little further as to what God was doing and saying through the minor prophets and their writings. Not just for the people of their day, but also for the people of Paul's day. And if for the people of Paul's day, then also the people of our day. So as much as Nahum is a, is a small book, we find that it is ready to speak to us even today. Reminds us of who our God is, that we claim to love and serve. Reminds us again of our position that we play in all of this, right? I mean, to, to think of the atrocities of the king of Nineveh during Nahum's day and the atrocities of these people. They were known for their cruelty. They were especially known for their cruelty. And yet Nahum is not the one that casts judgment upon them. Even though he feels he should or could. That's God's place. Okay? Same for us today. Even though at times we may feel we should or could be the ones that Disseminate the judgment of God. We are reminded again, no, no, no. We are faithful with the message. Let God take care of what he will take care of. 
and let us be faithful in what we have been given to take care of. Let's pray together. Father, thank you again for your word. How it reminds us of you, your goodness, and your work in our lives. Help us to continue to see what it is that you want to teach us and challenge us as we continue in our series through the Old Testament. And we pray in Jesus' name.